During World War II, there was no more dangerous place to be than in the skies over German-occupied Europe for a bomb occurred. By 1944, thousands of flak batteries and German fighters scoured the air in search of enemies, one being the iconic and deadly B-17 flying fortress that could rain down destruction. On November 21st, 1944, an event occurred with the B-17 that seemed impossible, yet it happened. What did the Allied forces witnessing the strange event do? What did the senior man on the ground, British Major John V. Crisp, do to stop the phantasmic plane? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former soldier, Marine Corps scout sniper, history professor, historian and book author, and we will answer these questions and other issues on this segment of Forgotten History. <laughs> the B-17G had a standard crew of 10, a pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, doubling his nose gunner, a flight engineer, doubling his top turret gunner, a radio operator, two waste gunners, a ball turret gunner, and a tail gunner. Bristling with 13 50 caliber machine guns, the B-17 could deliver sweeping damage to enemy fighters. The structural design created a strong aircraft that could also absorb a lot of damage. On November 21st, 1944, 1,291 heavy bombers of the 8th Air Force launched raids against several targets in Germany. The first bombardment group alone sent 421 B-17 flying fortresses against more than a dozen targets. The 401st Squadron was assigned the target of Merzberg Luna to hit the German synthetic oil refineries. One of these, a B-17G number 43-35845, was a lone aircraft from the 324th Squadron flown by pilot First Lieutenant Harold R. DeBolt. It was his 33rd mission and he had a seasoned crew. The force encountered nearly nine-tenths cloud cover en route to the target and over the target as well. The weather did not stop the radar-guided anti-aircraft guns or German fighters. Just before the bombers started their run, enemy fighters appeared and struck home, but there were no losses from the formations. As the bombers approached, the anti-aircraft fire they always expected rose up to greet them. The Germans threw everything from 88mm to 105mm shells that exploded at a pre-designated altitude. The exploding shells released thousands of large pieces of shrapnel that sliced through the thin aluminum skins of the bombers, often wounding or killing the men inside. The hot shrapnel also damaged the aircraft, often cutting oxygen and fuel lines, and most often damaging the engines. A B-17 with two engines had a fair chance of making it back to base unless picked up by German fighters. The German fighters broke off as the flak intensified, and DeBolt handed the controls over to the bombardier who opened the bomb bay doors. Then Flack hit the aircraft, and as the rest of the bombers dropped their ordnance and picked up speed, the bolts bombs would not drop due to a malfunctioning of the release mechanism. The B-17G, so new in the group that there was not even time to paint a name on her, fell farther behind from the protection of the box formation. Another Flack burst underneath the bomber released the bombs, which finally fell, lightening the load and hopefully allowing the bolt to pick up speed. DeBolt gave full power to the remaining two engines, hoping to gain some distance from the Germans on the ground, but they were still taking hits from German ground fire. Getting out was not easy. That was not going to happen, as the flak had shut down the number two and three engines, with the number three engine windmilling and creating dangerous vibrations, with DeBolt unable to feather that engine's propeller blades. The crew threw everything out of the aircraft to help keep it in the air, lightening the weight including guns and ammunition cases. There was still the danger of enemy fighters locating the stricken bomber, which would have been an easy target, and not having the 50 calibers on board for defense would mean total destruction. DeBolt and his co-pilot plotted a course toward Brussels and ordered the crew to get their parachutes ready. With two engines out and with a third about to die due to flak damage, DeBolt set a course for 270 degrees west and set the controls on autopilot over Belgian territory, where they had a good chance of reaching Allied lines but would they make it? On the ground, British Major John V. Crisp and his anti-aircraft unit located at Kortenberg, Belgium, watched in fascination as an aircraft came into view, an American B-17 heavy bomber. The observers on the ground saw that the landing gear was down 
and it looked as if it was on a final approach for landing. Given that this was not an airfield, the assumption was that the pilots may have had wounded on board and therefore wanted to try to land the aircraft to save their lives. But then the bomber dropped its forward attitude and the nose dipped toward the earth, causing the soldiers on the ground to drop or scatter fearing impact. The B-17 landed at a farm just beyond Kortenberg, Belgium, in the village of Holdenburg, on its main landing gear wheels and upon touching down bounced once and upon landing again dug one wheel into the ground of the plowed field causing the bomber to dip a wing which struck the ground spinning the aircraft around 45 degrees. Two engines were still running and they waited for the crew to climb out but after several long minutes without anyone emerging they rose to investigate. There had been no flares fired from the bomber indicating wounded were on board and there had been no radio transmissions that they were aware of announcing the bomber's arrival. 20 minutes later the ranking officer Major Crisp decided to inspect the situation, but he did so cautiously. The damaged engines and the other undamaged sole operating engine were spinning with the propellers were whirling, so Crisp had to approach cautiously, and he found his way in to the bomber alone. To his amazement, no one was on board, so he looked for dead crewmen and found none. He did find their abandoned flying gear, flag jackets, helmets, and some uneaten chocolate bars. Major Crisp remained the only person on board while he continued his search for clues as to what happened to the crew. He was puzzled to locate a dozen unused parachutes still on board. How did they get out, he wondered. While searching, he found the flight log in the navigator station that read, Bad Flack. He finally made his way to the cockpit and didn't see any damage to the controls or the instrument panel. No blood, no dead men. Well, during this process, the crew of the B-17 were confirmed safe at a Belgian airfield but there were still questions. They were all alive and well, and Lieutenant DeBolt reported that he and his crew exited the aircraft near Brussels due to damage sustained by flak. What had happened, according to the statements by DeBolt and the crew, are as follows. The bomber slowly lost altitude, and the crew remained on board as long as they could to exit German territory, and they waited. When the bomber dropped to 2,000 feet, DeBolt gave the order to bail out, and the entire crew safely exited the bomber, and all had good parachutes. They were successful in getting beyond German-held territory because as they landed, a British ground unit picked them up. However, their B-17 continued flying on autopilot. The location of the B-17's landing was confirmed to be 10 miles southeast of Brussels at Holdenburg, where the British unit was stationed. Investigators arrived at the bomber and found the plane's serial number, and this enabled commanders in the 8th Air Force to identify the plane as part of the 1st Bombardment Division, 91st Bomb Group, 324th Squadron, which was a contingent of B-17Gs that operated out of East Anglia, England. The squadron manifest had the crewmen listed, but they belonged to the 401st Squadron, which created more confusion until it was discovered that the bomber had been transferred from the other unit. The parachutes that remained in the aircraft were still a mystery, as the investigators wondered how the men bailed out. Usually, all the men on board wore their parachutes while in flight, with the exception to the ball turret gunner, and sometimes the pilot and co-pilot would fly with their parachutes nearby in case they were needed. The investigators spoke with the British soldiers and Major Crisp and collected their stories. They also looked at the bomber now in the plowed field. Major Crisp reported that the bomber did not have any exterior damage except what appeared to have happened in the crash. But then again, not being an airman and not familiar with flight damage, his error is understandable. There were discrepancies in the soldiers' statements and what the bomber crew gave in their statement. The soldiers claimed that the bomber came in with all four engines operating, which would have been impossible if two engines were damaged. DeBolt had stated that one engine was destroyed and one quit. Why the differences? The best guess is that the soldiers saw the nearest two engines working, one at full power, the other choking out and a third dead with the windmilling propeller. If the crew's story is true, it's bizarre that Major Chris believed that he had found all the parachutes on board. How else could the plane's crew have survived jumping from a plane if not using the parachutes? It's more likely that Major Crisp made an error on identifying the parachutes being on board. Parachutes were often kept on board in special pack sleeves and were so marked, and the empty containers were often stuffed with extra gear, ammo, or even food. It may have looked like parachutes to him. Later, Lieutenant DeBolt affirmed the engine damage and stated in his debriefing that, quote, we had been hit in the bomb bay. I'll be darned if I know why the bombs didn't explode, end quote. Unfortunately, the official report does not resolve this discrepancy, so we may never know why there were parachutes left behind if they were parachutes at all. How did this happen? Was it a miracle? Divine intervention? We may never know the answer. We hope you enjoyed this segment of Forgotten History. Please click like and subscribe for free 
And please stay tuned and be engaged and informed. Send us comments if you have questions or even show ideas, and we will respond to all requests and comments as soon as we can. Thank you.